Good morning. My name is Jenny Lyons. I'm a friend of Will's from seminary, and I actually live really close, just about 10 minutes down the road on the only Brookville border. Will and I got to know each other uh, because for our degree, we're both pursuing the Masters of Divinity, and for our degree, there's a four-semester, yes, two-year course that you take um, where they really encourage community and building um, strong relationships in a small group. So Will and I were two of an eight-person group who really got to know each other as we were walking into our first steps in professional ministry. Um, and he's just been such a blessing to me. I am sure he is such a blessing to all of you. And I join you in your prayers for this beautiful time with his mother um, while he's in Florida. So I'm honored to be here today. Thank you for having me. This is a wonderful church. Um, our gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. And I'm reading for, from the New Revised Standard Version. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believes in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were tied around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one, of not, with one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Nice, lighthearted scripture, huh? I admit, I come to this text through the eyes of one who did not grow up in the church. And I spent the first few years of my conversion trying hard to fit into my pastor's idea of right and wrong. In this text, I see my former self as John, so sure I have all the answers. Teacher, John says, there's a guy exercising demons in your name. But don't worry, we told the dude to stop. The reason given is the man wasn't following the disciples. Other translations say the man isn't one of us. But the irony is that earlier in the chapter, the disciples tried to cast out a demon in Jesus' name, and they failed miserably. It must have been quite a shock then to see this guy who isn't even one of the insiders achieving the very miracle that had so confounded them. Maybe they were jealous. Probably prideful, too. A bit of looking down their noses at the guy because they were the insiders. We can't know for sure, but my guess is it's complicated, as people are. For his part, Jesus is having none of it. Not only does Jesus flat out say, don't stop him, he adds that no one doing good in the power of his name can quickly turn against God. He flips the situation on its head. This guy the disciples scolded is actually for us. 
He's on our side. Jesus expands to say that anyone who gives another a cup of water because the receiver follows Jesus will be rewarded. Here, we learn that it doesn't have to be miracles, like driving out demons. Doing something that most of us have the power to do, provide water, is worthy. Everyday actions matter. How we treat those who claim Christ matters. But serving a cup of water in Jesus' day, that was actually very risky business. Today, in the United States, we have freedom of speech and religion. It doesn't cost us much to fill water from a tap, a cup from a tap. Remember, though, when Jesus said this, he was hunted. He didn't die in a car crash, as the saying goes. His death was premeditated, brutal murder by many people working together to make it happen in the most torturous of ways. To offer a Jesus follower a cup of water at that time could literally be the server's death sentence. No one claiming his name or serving others doing so in a time like that is an outsider. We then flip from rewards to punishments and we get this litany of metaphors that might make you cringe. They do me. A bit of taking the disciples to task. Jesus wants them to understand the seriousness of trying to hinder the man doing good in his name. Making one stumble is worse than being tied with a millstone and thrown into the sea. Millstones ground grain for food, and they were so important to sustaining life at the time that they were actually legally forbidden to take as payment. A life-giving stone that in this case takes life. Faith, too, is meant to be life-giving, but it can become deadly. Actually, what Jesus says is that if any one of us causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. It's interesting that he uses the phrase little ones because just before our passage, two disciples argue about who is greater. Jesus says, the one who wants to be first must be last and the servant of all. He points to a child as the model which is very surprising in a society where children were powerless. In fact, they were so invaluable that they weren't even supposed to be mourned if they died before the age of 10. These people, the culture deems as nothing. Jesus says have incredible worth. He could even be referring more broadly to others relegated to the margins, for there were many. Jesus' followers had just tried to take this guy with a godly power and push him to the side, put him in his place. Did the disciples' words cause the man to stumble? The Greek root word for stumble is actually the same root word as to scandalize. Causing one to stumble is to scandalize them to the point that they struggle with their faith. I have a church friend, or at least one who did go to church, who confided in another over a temptation he struggled with. That one confidant spread that juicy gossip around the community, and my friend was permanently marred allowed to serve and give money but excluded socially, had rules of conduct placed on him in church under the guise of helping him resist temptation. He tried really hard to work in that system for several years. Anxiety and depression led to suicidal thoughts. If God's people could treat him that way, maybe God didn't want him either. That is of dire importance to God. You mess someone up like that, and that stone, that faith that may have brought you life at one time, now becomes a tool of death that will pull you neck first to the depths, and that is actually better than what's in store for the one who scandalized another's faith. 
then we move to stumbling ourselves, it doesn't get any easier. If anything is causing us to lose our faith or to fall away, we are to amputate it from our lives. Chopping off a hand, a foot, or even gouging out an eye is better than ending up in this hell of torture where worms don't die and the fire is never quenched. Now, I want to be very clear. Jesus does not want us to harm our God-given bodies in any way or to endure a horrific place for all time. His assumption and ours is that no one is so intent on ungodly action that we are willing to lose a body part for it. But this is some powerful language. Jesus chooses these images to illustrate the importance of his words. Jesus also talks about the kingdom of God here, thank God. In much of the New Testament, the kingdom of God refers to an already present, but not yet fully realized, reign of God. A place of beauty where all are loved, included, and have enough. In this passage, we see eternal words. Jesus is inviting hearers to a path of life. God desires that we eliminate that which prevents us from doing ministry, even if it means we do so with less resources than we would have otherwise had. If money, prestige, and power are bringing you down, give them up. If lust is the problem, flee from it. Integrity is vital. Pursue it. All will be salted with fire. What does that mean? Well, in Jesus' day, there were no refrigerators. Salting food and smoking it by fire preserved the meat. Think of smoked salmon today, one of my favorites. Being salted makes something better, tastier, longer lasting. Salt was also used with fire in animal sacrifice. So taken together, the the fire preserves us, enriches us, makes us better, so that we can offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in service to God. Suddenly, fire that a minute ago was unquenchable and ghastly is now something good. God is inviting us to ignite a holy inferno within and around us, with tongues of fire and the Holy Spirit emblazoning our path ahead. And in case there is any doubt, Jesus flat out says, salt is good. Yet there is a caution that salt can lose its saltiness. Israel's Dead Sea provided a massive source of valuable salt, but it was full of impurities that could make it go bad. There was no fixing that. Once the salt is bad, it's thrown out. Jesus avoids us to, uh, warns us to avoid the impurities around us and remain joined with God. The scripture also says everyone will undergo a holy salting. All means all, none left out. Now, I want to add here, for those of us who know we've already been salted, this does not say when all will be salted. Jesus tells us to love others like we love ourselves and notes he is the gate in John 10. He is the judge, not us. Jesus clearly connected this fiery salting with hell. Could it be possible that there is another opportunity at some point for those who haven't accepted Jesus yet to meet him. As my friend Kristen says, if all will be salted by fire, the notion that all believers go to heaven and all unbelievers go to hell falls a bit flat to me. It seems options, adjustments, expansion of beliefs and humility because after all, we aren't God, are key. The bottom line is that we don't know exactly what happens after death. Anyone who says they know who is in and who is out, they're lying. Jesus is the judge, not us. Jesus says to those of us who know him already to stay salty, people. Stay salty. 
Staying salty is tied to being at peace with one another. The biblical concept of peace is so much more than the absence of hostility. It's a state of being whole or complete, and it harkens back to the Israeli understanding of shalom, a rich and beautiful Hebrew word that connotes relational well-being. Earlier in the book, in Mark 5, Jesus tells a woman he just healed to go in peace, which carries a sense of friendship and favor. The peace we are called to goes beyond just not harming someone or scandalizing their faith. It includes a sense of unity and oneness, of relationship. Mark's original audience was a mix of first century Jews and Gentiles trying to understand who Jesus is. These people who have otherized one another for millennia. Jews scandalized Gentiles, especially Samaritans, who also believed in God for not being God's chosen ones. Gentiles scandalized Jews for being beneath them socially. Jesus' disciples scandalized the man for casting out demons and placed themselves at risk of stumbling. All are in, needing, in need of salting by fire, enriching holy fire, so that they can unify in Christ. With Jesus' words, their battles, their envy, their pride are to fall aside. They are joined. Notice this does not make them the same. But it does mean that they listen to one another. They refrain from judging and valuing each other based on ethnic, racial, social, theological, political, gender, and other differences. Today, we have many expressions of church. Catholic, Unitarian, Episcopal, and now the new global Methodist church. Made up of people who were just part of our denomination last month. Differing theologies have ripped Christians apart for centuries. We spend so much time pointing fingers over how we live our faith. We tell people they aren't good enough, that this one or that one is going to hell because they think or live differently. We scandalize each other over and over and over again. These words from Jesus' mouth are still so relevant today. Those who claim Christ, even if they don't go to our church or share our theology or vote the way we do, they are our sister. They are our brother. The text invites us to discard notions of us versus them. The name of Jesus makes us one body aligned with the very God of the universe. Can you see it? People who have been fighting over this theology or that expression of faith, holding hands, serving together, living the vision we want to see and inviting the world to do the same alongside us as one human family, as created beings of sacred worth called to more than the mess around us, called to healing that mess, called to joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, called to feeding, clothing, soothing, embracing, serving, holding, and blessing, in short, loving one another. Friends, let God's vision flood the recesses of your mind. God wants it to be our vision. And God says that it is possible. In fact, God promises God will bring this and asks us, invites us to trust that promise and fan the Spirit's holy flames, blazing God's holy fire across the world and making that vision happen here and now. Let's do it together.
Peace be with you. Amen.